Meet Ceratosaurus. To begin, let's go back to the late 19th century, smack dab in the middle of the Bone Wars. This was a time of competitive paleontology, with scientists Charles Marsh and Edward Cope duking it out for who could find and name the most fossils. Stratosaurus came into this war in 1883, and while Charles Marsh is often credited with its discovery, it was actually farmer Marshall Felch who found and dug it up. It was, however, studied and named by Marsh after being shipped to his museum. What's special is that this holotype was in articulation, meaning the bones were preserved connected to each other similar to how they were in real life. The skeleton was also nearly complete, giving a great first look at Stratosaurus and making it the best understood theropod at the time. Stratosaurus translates to horned lizard in Greek. If that isn't enough, Marsh gave it the species name Nazicornis, which then translates to nose horn. Together, this animal's full name, Ceratosaurus Nazicornis, loosely translates to horned lizard with a nose horn. So yeah, this dinosaur had horns, in case you missed out. In 1982, Marsh published the first skeletal reconstruction of Ceratosaurus, which would now be considered outdated. The tail was dragging on the ground, the posture was upright, and a slew of other issues that we just didn't really know about back then. It wasn't until the 1920s that we get a new idea of what Ceratosaurus looked like. Paleontologist Charles Gilmore illustrated and mounted the bones in a way that was not just years, but decades ahead of its time. The animal was depicted running with a horizontal posture and raised tail. These kinds of dinosaur depictions wouldn't be popular until 30 plus years later. Moving to the late 1900s, some new Ceratosaurus fossils were found. From these were created two new species, Ceratosaurus dentisulcatus and Ceratosaurus magnicornis. The dentisulcatus specimen was found by James Madsen and his team in the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry of Utah. This represents one of the largest Ceratosaurus known. It was given a new species name because of the unique grooves in its teeth. The Magnacorna specimen was discovered by Thor Erickson in Colorado, one heck of a name by the way. The new species name was given here because of its larger nose horn. Now both of these new species aren't completely agreed on. Some scientists think that they were just ages, with Stratosaurus nasicornis being slightly younger and these two new species being older individuals. A while after, in 1999, paleontologist Brooks Britt reported an even younger Ceratosaurus found in Wyoming, being quite a bit smaller than the others and consisting of a complete skull, among several other bones. Ceratosaurus has been found all over the American Midwest. Though not as common as other animals like Allosaurus or Stegosaurus, it made a strong claim over the area. And similar to Allosaurus, it's also been found outside of the United States in Portugal. Stratosaurus remains have also been reportedly found in Tanzania and even Switzerland, though whether these specimens were truly Ceratosaurus or just a very closely related animal are still up in the air. Overall, the discovery history of Ceratosaurus is pretty straightforward, but it's the interpretations that come afterward that get much more interesting. As for how big the animal was, it fell into the medium size range at an average of 20 feet long and 6 feet high. Weight estimates fall anywhere from 900 to 1.5 thousand pounds, so let's use 1.2 thousand as a general value. That's about the same size as an American Quarter Wars. Not massive, but certainly sizable by modern standards. As for unique features, let's start with the obvious, the horns. These are one of the features that makes Stratosaurus so recognizable. It's one of, if not the only, theropod to have three noticeable structures on its head. On first look, they might seem like some cool weapons for defense, and that won't be far off from what scientists first thought of them. But these structures wouldn't be very helpful for combat at all. They weren't really horned as much as crests, being too delicate to handle stress. Instead, they were mostly used for display, Having grooves that indicate blood vessels going into them, it have a layer of keratin, so their true shape isn't just unknown, but likely varied in between individuals. 
Another important note here is that these display structures were barely noticeable on babies, so they were likely also used to signal maturity. Moving down, we find a unique pair of arms, not quite large enough for combat or hunting often, but certainly not as small as those on large theropods like T-Rex. Even more, it had four fingers on each hand, which isn't too common in theropods. Only the first three had claws too. Not the most useful for catching prey, but definitely not vestigial. Some have proposed that the hands could be used for grabbing, and the first digit could have turned inwards when flexed, so maybe they were used for hunting on occasion after all. Now this next adaptation is one that truly sets Ratosaurus apart. Where most theropods had a bare and naked back, this dinosaur was adorned with structures never before seen in its kind. Along its back ran a single row of osteoderms, while creatures like iguanas and some chameleons had a line of spikes made of soft tissue, the ones seen on Ceratosaurus were made of solid bone. Bony plates embedded in the skin went down from its head all the way to the end of its tail. The only animals alive today with similar structures are crocodilians and a few other reptiles, like the earless monitor lizard. And while most of the osteoderms of Ceratosaurus have been found on the midline, there have been others whose place is not known. So while the spine of Ceratosaurus may have had the biggest pieces of armor, there may have been even more spread across its back and body. This begs the question, what was a theropod like Ceratosaurus doing with such a unique type of structure? Protection? Display? Or perhaps something else entirely? It's not unlikely that these osteoderms had blood vessels going into them just like the crests. So maybe, just maybe, they were much more different than they seem like at first glance. The truth is, we don't know, and maybe we never will. But this is where you come in. What do you think they were used for? Moving on. Stratosaurus definitely seems like a formidable predator, but the role it played in its ecosystem was that of an underdog. The Stratosaurus that lived in what's now America and Portugal shared similar environments and residents, many of which were bigger, faster, and stronger. Large theropods like Allosaurus and Torvosaurus rule, forcing Ceratosaurus to live a separate lifestyle to avoid competition. These larger theropods had everything going for them, and they outnumbered Ceratosaurus populations at around 7 to 1. And yet, Ceratosaurus still survived in a land of giants, including herbivores. Titanic sauropods like Apatosaurus and Brachiosaurus roamed the lands, and could easily end the life of a Ceratosaurus with a short stomp. Stegosaurus, with four lethal thagomizers up to three feet long, could fatally wound with a precise strike. There was even an ankylosaur, Gargoylosaurus, which was bulky, armored, and had an arsenal of spikes. Life for Ceratosaurus was not easy, not by a long shot. Thankfully, there were still a number of smaller animals for it to hunt. There was Dryosaurus, a small but quick iguanodont, Frutidens, a beaked heterodontosaur, Ornitholestes, a small predatory theropod, an assortment of small mammals, and Chimarasaurus, a sauropod that wasn't quite as large as the others. Although in order to take something like that down, some pack hunting might be in order. Now is when I'd usually jump into the media section of the video, but I'm going to branch off here, so stick with me. Stratosaurus lived in such a hostile environment that it needed adaptations to give it not only an upper hand, but a different lifestyle entirely. In 2004, paleontologist Robert Backer and scientist Gary Burr made the claim that Ceratosaurus had an affinity towards bodies of water and may have been a good swimmer. They noticed the spines along its tail were taller compared to other theropods and had deep chevron bones on the underside. This is similar to crocodilians, leading the scientists to claim that Ceratosaurus was a good swimmer. However, researcher Xiang Yu Yun made an argument 15 years later that reevaluated the concept, noting that there just wasn't enough evidence for a semi aquatic ceratosaurus, at least for the moment. However, I was able to dig up, pun intended, some info about a discovery that hasn't been published or described yet about ceratosaurus. This information was only available through the archives of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. In October of 2000, previously mentioned Brooks Britt announced new Ceratosaurus specimens that included the largest skull to date, measuring 2.66 feet long. 
Based on this, the individual's full length would have been at around 28 feet, an elder. This ceratosaurus may have been able to hold its own against the bigger and more dangerous theropods it lived with, but something else was found here. In the tail of at least one of these fossils were bundles of ossified tendons, no different than the tendons we're used to, connecting bone to muscle, but these tendons were themselves made of bone. This would have given the tail and animal the power it needed for balance as well as bone-powered propulsion and maneuverability in water, similar to how ossified tendons work in crocodilians. If Ceratosaurus was spending time around water, it makes sense for it to be in water as well. It also had some of the longest teeth relative to skull size of any theropod, which would have been great for eating fish, crocodiles, and other aquatic prey. So while the concept of a semi-aquatic Ceratosaurus was disproved in the past, this might be the key to getting that door open again. And even if Ceratosaurus wasn't semi-aquatic in any way, it was clearly doing something that no other theropod could. Time may tell just what that was. But hey, that's just a theory. Wow, that was a lot. Now we can finally get into the media that Ceratosaurus has been featured in. In its early years, it was seen as an awesome and unique theropod, and it was given some pretty big roles in films like Brute Force, the first live-action dinosaur film, and One Million Years BC as one of the most dangerous animals in the movie. As time went on though, the more bigger and badder predatory dinosaurs started to take the spotlight. Tyrannosaurus rex and even Allosaurus started to become household names, while Ceratosaurus was left in the dust. Since the early 2000s, Ceratosaurus has only appeared in media to be used as a visual gag or punching bag for other dinosaurs to show off their strength. It appeared in Jurassic Park 3 just for an attempt at toilet humor, and it got a short spotlight in the documentaries called Jurassic Fight Club and When Dinosaurs Owned America though it's only shown in them as an incompetent hunter and fodder for dinosaurs like Allosaurus. But there is hope. In fact, a series is in production right now that is working to give Stratosaurus a redemption in modern media. Meet Dinosaur Empire. Follow a journey of three young Stratosaurus brothers struggling to find their place in the brutal and unforgiving world they've been born into. As they grow up, they'll face off against enemies like Kurok the Torvosaurus, and many others. This series is aiming to strike a balance between science and creativity, with up-to-date dinosaurs interacting in a much more story-oriented fashion. The Ceratosaurus brothers themselves have even been given some unique characteristics, both in their physical appearance and behaviors. The designs for these brothers were also used as reference throughout the entire video as well. The team behind this project is a lineup of some of the best in the industry of storytelling, creativity, and dinosaur science. There is screenwriter Robert Lance, who worked on The Lion King, Shrek, and Toy Story. Also, Raul Ramos, known for his paleo art featured in Path of Titans and Personal Pieces, along with Scott Hartman and Todd Green as scientific consultants. There's tons more that I haven't even mentioned, so check out the YouTube channel to see interviews with their team. Adding even more to this is the co-director, the two-time Emmy Award-winning David Krenz, known for his work in Disney's Dinosaur, Anotasia, and Primal. To top it all off is the primary director, Gerardo Rodriguez, the CEO of Graco Films, the studio behind this awesome project. And even though I just listed a lot of names, this is still considered a relatively small team. That means they'll need our help to bring Dinosaur Empire to your screens. Down below, you'll find a link to their Kickstarter page. This is how Dinosaur Empire is being funded. With generous donations by you, this awesome prehistoric adventure can become a reality. And not only do you get to support a series of the century, but you'll get some super cool perks. Everything from professional artwork to physical models of the characters themselves. They've already teased the Kurok the Torvosaurus figure on their YouTube channel, but there's many more to come. I've already got my eyes peeled for a Ceratosaurus figure, so you better click the link below to get notified for when the campaign goes live. That way you can donate to see these amazing animals come to life, both on your screen and in your home. So let's show our support for this new empire, the Dinosaur Empire. Other than Dinosaur Empire, the developing video game Primeval Horizon is also working to undo the reputation of Ceratosaurus. Here it's a powerful bleeder and pack hunter 
with a preference towards aquatic biomes. Primeval Horizon is also going to have a stronger storytelling and sci-fi aspect compared to many other dinosaur survival games. Some concept art from their Discord server shows what looks to be ominous structures, boss battles, and even aliens. Click the link in the description to give these projects some support. And that wraps up March's Prehistoric Animal. Ceratosaurus is my favorite dinosaur, so I wanted to make this video jam-packed with everything I love about it. From the mystery, uniqueness, and battle against the odds, Ceratosaurus made its claim as an amazing prehistoric animal. Let me know your favorite part about Ceratosaurus below. Join the Discord to hang out with nerds like you, and come over to twitch.tv slash paleoentertainment to chat with the community live. Support Dinosaur Empire and Primeval Horizon by clicking the links below, and as always, keep your pencil sharp.